Hello and welcome to the third part of our demonstration uh, regarding the project Coherent Optical Wireless for Next Generation Home and Corporate Networks, uh, short named uh, CAUS. I am Thomas Kamalakis from the Harokopia University of Athens. And um, where we, uh, we pick off, we take off from where we um, what we last discussed uh, in the previous presentation. Um, we discussed uh, the uh, component, tech some, some information uh, regarding the component technology. And uh, now we are going to take a look at the um, link design and uh, specifications. Uh, this is, of course, a very important uh, part uh, for the project because um, we will be able to demonstrate the truly broadband nature of the CAUS, the coherent optical wireless that is system. So let's talk a little bit about uh, performance measures. Um, of course, the most popular um, performance measure for uh, us, the physical layer guys, is the error probability. Uh, of course, the error probability um, counts how many bits uh, how, uh, discusses, uh, is actually the probability uh, of erroneous reception of a bit uh, which is the fundamental um, measure of information. So a probability uh, 10 to the minus 3 uh, indicates that one out of uh, 1000 bits is received with error. Um, okay, so uh, of course one uh, must realize that this is a physical layer uh, performance measure. It cannot uh, measure uh, the quality of experience. Uh, for instance, if you stream a video, uh, this uh, probability 10 to the minus 3, uh, how does it translate to the user experience? This is a very difficult subject to address. Um, it uh, depends on the quality of the video, then on the encoding uh, uh, way, and the way it is encoded and stuff like that. Um, we are not going to... We, it is outside the scope of the project to discuss how the user experience is actually translated to the probability of error. Uh, but this is a very interesting uh, subject uh, nevertheless. And we usually in uh, uh, wireless technology uh, we usually set uh, a, a minimum bit error rate uh, requirement. Uh, we do not want our bit error rate, our probability of error, to surpass a given uh, a specification. Uh, 10 to the minus 3 is usually common. In uh, optical communication we also use uh, even lower bounds, uh, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 9. But uh, since this is uh, primarily a wireless uh, rather than wireline um, application, we decided to set the threshold to 10 to the minus 3. The idea is that um, if you achieve uh, this probability threshold, um, you can be sure that um, by choosing appropriate uh, coding techniques uh, you can uh, reduce the uh, actual probability of error to uh, near zero. Uh, so if you obtain an uncoded error probability 10 to the minus 3, there are coding techniques, uh, with some of which we have um, so examined in, our, uh, in the project, convolutional coding um, and other block code uh, techniques they can reduce the probability of error to below uh, 10 to the minus 12. That is a very low error probability. Uh, <coughs> so, in order to start designing the uh, coherent optical wireless link, you need uh, some specifications. Uh, some, uh, what do you want to achieve? And what you can actually purchase or um, find in your laboratory or uh, in the market. Uh, perhaps one of the most important 
one of the most important um, measures for the uh, one of the most important input parameters for the design is the laser line width. Uh, in coherent communication, laser line the laser line width is a very important parameter because it um, qualifies the level of coherence of the optical source. Um, a large uh, line with uh, a laser with a large line line width implies that um, it is not very phase coherent. Um, its phase drifts as the laser uh, starts uh, as time passes. So, um, uh, when you want to mix this laser with a local oscillator field, which has also cell has some line width, uh, you understand that. You may, you may. Uh, it is possible not to obtain a very suitable, uh, a very high mixing efficiency because of this uh, phase decoherence. Uh, so the laser line width is very important, um, and there are various schemes for um, uh, for correcting uh, phase the the laser phase. Uh, Actually, what you do is uh, you mit mitigate the laser phase noise. I mean, this um, la this phase drift is is, is um, actually uh, appears as phase noise, uh, which contaminates the phase of the signal. So uh, there are uh, various techniques, either uh, using digital uh, signal processing, which is uh, standard in. Uh, state-of-the-art uh, wireline uh, fiber optic coherent systems uh, or there are even proposal to proposals to achieve this in the at the optical layer with um, at the optical level with uh, uh, various mode locking techniques and um, what they actually trying to do is uh, realize a phase lock looped uh, sorry a phase locked uh, loop um, uh, in uh, optic uh, with uh, optic components, this is of course not very easy to achieve. But there are some uh, proposals which show promise in the laboratory. Now, in our case, we have um, assumed that the uh, laser um, phase noise is mitigated with using digital signal processing, that is electronic circuits. And um, there are very there are a number of techniques to do that. Um, there is a seminal paper by Kikusi, which discusses this uh, such uh, an approach. We implemented uh, his method uh, based on uh, 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 for achieving uh, phase recovery. And uh, what you actually do is you carry out a simulation with his uh, uh, phase correcting scheme and uh, try to understand uh, what is the required signal to noise ratio per symbol that is how much t uh, how much how many times uh, does the signal needs to be uh, higher than the uh, additive noise uh, power uh, and um, you do this for various line widths you actually uh, use the uh, product of the uh, line laser line width, which is measured in megahertz, with the symbol duration. Um, this is um, a very uh, a uh, this is a, uh, a standard procedure in uh, coherent communications because the mm, you are not only interested in the uh, signal line width on the in the laser line width, but you are rather interested in the product of the laser line width to the symbol duration. It turns out that um, this is actually the most important parameter. But of course the symbol duration is fixed uh, from the data rate. So if you use QPSK, that is you transmit um, two, sim two bits per symbol, then uh, your uh, symbol duration is actually um, 2 to the minus 9 uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, five to the minus nine. So, uh, the uh, assuming a laser line with source of 100 kilohertz, uh, you get these uh, products. Now, 
uh, for a l for a lower line widths, uh, you achieve a larger uh, product. Uh, sorry, for la for lower data rates, you achieve uh, a lower uh, product because the symbol duration is longer. And you can see that in this diagram, we saw that uh, the larger the uh, this product is, uh, the uh, higher is the si uh, signal to noise requirement in order to achieve this error probability threshold we discussed earlier, 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so uh, imagine what happens if you also choose um, a source with a, li a larger line width, 5 megahertz. Uh, 100 kilohertz is quite standard, you can find uh, um, DFB lasers um, that have this uh, uh, such small uh, such small line width, five megahertz are um, is actually the line width of cheaper uh, laser sources, and we also need to consider this. So, for uh, ten gigabit per second, <coughs> the product is ten to the minus three, while for two gigabit per second, the product is five to the uh, five times uh, ten to the minus three. So, uh, if you look at this diagram, in any case you actually require a, a signal-to-noise ratio of at least 16 dBs in, uh, at the receiver in order uh, to be free of uh, any... Uh, in order to uh, be sure that you guarantee an error probability of at least 10 to the minus 3. Now, um, of course, using uh, larger data rates is actually uh, advantageous because the signal duration is uh, the sorry the symbol duration is smaller and the phase have has uh, even small smaller time to drift. So this is why uh, at higher data rates you need uh, you can tolerate a larger uh, line with uh, laser line width. So. Uh, you use this figure to update to see how much uh, signal to noise ratio you actually require in order to achieve this uh, threshold probability error probability now once you have that uh, you can start estimating um, several transmitter parameters now there is uh, some considerable uh, uh, work d uh, we that we did the, uh, here we simu we provided the model for uh, the coherent optical wireless link from end to end. Um, we discussed uh, how the beam shaping and uh, transmitter and receiver optics can be designed, um, and it all boils down to uh, actually estimating the um, uh, uh, the product of the transmitter uh, power to the receiving uh, area. Of course, if you use a large receiver, uh, you uh, at, uh, at the terminal end uh, down here, then uh, you obtain much more power. Uh, but of course, you get a bulky uh, receiver. So um, one of the driving uh, ideas behind the project is that the coherent detection, that coherent detection can provide, uh, can be used. Um, in order to have smaller receivers which could be placed on uh, even in uh, highly mobile devices laptops, stuff like that so um, there are some design equations that uh, relate this uh, fundament this product that I discussed the uh, product of the uh, optical power to the receiver uh, area to some of the fundamental um, parameters and the specification of the link and um, if you assume that uh, you get you, you want an SNR uh, signal to noise ratio as high as 30 dB and um, at the center at point A which is the center of the coverage region and you get and, and you require that this 30 dB SNR does not degrade by m no more than 10 dB at the coverage area uh, boundary then uh, this is measured by the uh, SNR degradation factor K then you can 
uh, actually estimate the this product uh, given your the size of uh, the required size of your uh, coverage radius. Um, let's say uh, one meter radius, uh, in order to obtain a micro cell inside uh, the room. So. <coughs> For 2 gigabit per second, you want um, a product of 17.4 milliwatt per square centimeter, uh, times square centimeters. Uh, so, if you postulate a um, um, well class 1 uh, transmitter power at uh, 150 nanometers, uh, you get a small size receiver w with uh, 17.4 square centimeters. Now, in order to obtain this, uh, to use the same uh, transmitter, uh, t sorry, the same receiver to collect data at 10 gigabit, you need to increase this um, power transmitted power receiver area product to uh, t uh, five times this uh, because it is five times the data rate and uh, the uh, noise bind the electrical bandwidth is increased uh, by five times uh, so anyway uh, you still end up with uh, five only five milliwatts of power transmitted to free space and this is important because at um, a wavelength of 150 uh, sorry, uh, one hundred uh, uh, one fifty-five micrometer mic micrometers. Uh, this is well class one. Uh, this is well uh, below the class one specification, which is, I believe, ten milliwatts. Now, uh, if you are interested uh, in uh, this uh, design procedure, uh, you can of course access our article. Um, uh, here is the uh, the link. Um, it's in Optics Communication discussing uh, this uh, design process in full detail, and um, the actual uh, the, uh, the the PDF will be upload would be uploaded in the CAUS website. Sorry, I switched off the PowerPoint. Here we go again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here we go. Okay. So, um, w uh, which is the signal to noise uh, distribution? This is uh, the required, uh, they receive power in the uh, DBMs and the SNR uh, we see that uh, it has a peak at about 30 dB and as you move away from the point A which is the point in the coverage region which is the maximum which has the maximum SNR it quickly drops to uh, 10 dB. Now if, I, uh, if you see uh, this area here which is uh, 20 uh, the 20 dB limit is actually corresponding to about uh, one one uh, meter radius circle. Okay, now I will uh, also discuss another point, uh, which is uh, of uh, which is the motivation behind the optical wireless uh, and especially its their coherent version. Now. In conventional optical wireless, using a direct detection, we have the we must mitigate the effect of uh, multipath propagation. Now, what is multipath propagation? Um, the the signal could reach the receiver uh, not only uh, through the line of sight component, but also uh, in the uh, through the uh, diffuse uh, reflections that uh, the beam could uh, i mean the beam could hit a wall and uh, the, the there it is reflected diffusely in all directions so it can reach the 
receiver through a secondary the secondary path uh, of course uh, much like in uh, conventional radio um, radio system this causes uh, multipath uh, propagation and uh, actually uh, you need somehow to equalize this because uh, signals arrive uh, you, you at the receiver you obtain delayed versions of the same signal which results in what we call intercible interference. Intercible interference or ISI is a very uh, detrimental effect for high speed communications because the pulses start to overlap with each other and the, you, you get uh, some kind of interference noise which limits the bit error rate. Now, uh, for uh, in the okay, so in conventional optical wireless, uh, this is an important consideration. Now, in coherent optical wireless, the uh, the multipath effect is uh, removed because uh, when the signal uh, bounces on a wall, uh, it is reflected diffusely and. This means that it loses its phase coherence. And uh, this is uh, uh, because at the, the surfaces of the room, uh, okay, you may think that the wall of the, of the room is uh, relatively uh, flat, but actually, uh, if you go to a, a, a wavelength scale uh, of the optical beam, uh, it is very rough. It is a rough surface. So uh, the, uh, the beam does not. Uh, it, it does not uh, does not fall uh, does not um, is not incident in a flat surface but rather a, a rough surface and this causes uh, the diffuse reflection light is scattered randomly in all in pretty much all directions uh, with the scattering it loses its um, phase coherence its spatial phase coherence so um, diffuse light is very difficult to mix uh, it's it's uh, rather impossible to mix with uh, uh, the well organized spatial uh, field of the, the the spatially well organized field of the local oscillator so in a way coherent detection has the advantage of of cancelling all multipath components now uh, this means that uh, you not you do not require any equalization because you don't have ISI you only get the line of sight component okay so um, the same can be said for ambient, li uh, ambient line noise ambient line noise will not uh, mix well with the um, uh, local oscillator field but uh, even if it doesn't even uh, if it doesn't mix well if it is strong enough it can cause some short noise at uh, some electronic some some electric uh, noise uh, some electric noise at the receiver due to short noise that is you get a power uh, that falls in the photo detector uh, whether it is mixed with the local oscillator or not this is no, of no consequence it will uh, contribute to the short noise of the system and uh, we have um, implemented the model for calculating the um, effect of um, uh, ambient light noise. It is based on well-known models found in the literature. And uh, we have seen that uh, for an average... Uh, in, the, in the average case, the most important uh, ambient light uh, source is, of course, the sun. Uh, if you are in a room with uh, windows, then um, the sunlight can be very strong compared to other sources such as incandescent or uh, uh, fluorescent lamps or halogen lamps or what have you. So uh, we did some measurements and we saw that uh, sunlight uh, has a very large irradiance uh, in at both uh, at uh, both wavelengths we examined. That is uh, the 1550 nanometers and the 780 nanometers the radiance uh, values that is 
how much power you collect over a, a given uh, for, uh, over uh, uh, the power density rather that you collect uh, uh, the spectral power density you collect it is measured in uh, watts per square meter per nanometer uh, it can be quite large whereas the the same power that you collect from typical halogen lamps placed uh, in a room uh, is much smaller is an order of magnitude smaller and anyway uh, we discussed a scenario where um, you have uh, one window facing uh, which is illuminated by the sun and um, we calculated the average uh, light irradiance uh, it, it depending on the uh, various scenarios the average uh, light uh, irradiance can be as high as 15 milliwatts per square meter per nanometer now uh, there is of course the contribution of the halogen lamp uh, the uh, uh, the sun irradiance is very large at the window uh, or near the window but you usually do not place uh, the terminal so close to the window so as you move away from the window the uh, the light uh, irradiance that originates from the sun uh, gradually diminishes and what is left is um, at some extent the effect of the irradiance caused by the illumination by the artificial illumination you have in the room so in any case uh, we calculate that uh, the average irradiance uh, may not surpass, easily surpass um, 20 milliwatts per square meter per nanometer and in order to sustain a 10 gigabit or a 2 gigabit uh, per second link you need uh, an increase of power uh, about uh, 1.5 dB for the 10 gigabit system and about 2.53 dBs for the uh, 2 gigabit uh, per second system okay now uh, what uh, what do you see when you compare uh, this uh, coherent optical wireless system with a conventional conventional IMDD now uh, if we assume a scheme with the same spectral efficiency that is you transmit two bits per symbol um, you need to resort to some kind of four uh, pulse amplitude modulation for PAM system uh, to get the same uh, spectral efficiency uh, I don't want to bore you with the math but uh, depending on the amount of the of the received power you get a gain an actual gain in, uh, in uh, the transmitter uh, at the transmitter which can be, which can be as high as uh, 22 to 23 dBs at uh, if the receiver signal uh, the receive signal is low and um, even if it is in the order of minus, uh, minus 30 dB minus 25 dB you still get about uh, 15 to 16 dBs of uh, gain increase uh, it is as if uh, the coherent detection system works as if uh, the power that uh, reaches the receiver is about 15 dBs, 15 dBs uh, larger okay so here is the uh, setup we use for conducting some uh, initial measurements of the, of the coherent channel and stuff like that you see here we have uh, this source is the signal source it uh, is connected with the polarization controller because um, uh, the optical fiber, the, sorry, the coherent system is actually a polarization dependent and um, this is true not only for when mixing the, two, the, two la the local oscillator with the received signal but this is also true because of the phase modulator, with the IQ modulator rather the IQ modulators are uh, inherently uh, polarization dependent uh, okay, after uh, leaving the um, IQ modulator, the system comes here, the signal comes here to a free space optic uh, arrangement 
this is an experiment with a, a collimated beam, that is, we did not allow the beam to uh, spread um, in this setup. We have, uh, we have also carried out experiments where we have a spreading of the beam in order to show that uh, this device here, it's a fiber port, uh, it collects the power uh, some portion of the power. In this case, it collects a rather, a rather large por portion of the power because the beam is collimated, but if the beam is not collimated, then you still collect uh, some power without significant losses. That is, if you measure the power that impinges here uh, with the power actually coupled inside the fiber, it is not uh, it is not highly attenuated, I will discuss this uh, further below. Then you pass the signal to another uh, pole controller, then you have here the, uh, an, integrated, uh, an integrated coherent detector, which is fed with this uh, laser here, this laser is the local oscillator. And of course the local oscillator, uh, it is um, a highly uh, a tunable laser, uh, you do not have to use a tunable laser, um, but if you do, you need a precise uh, wavelength and, uh, sorry, uh, current and uh, temperature control. Now, this may look bulky here, but uh, remember that uh, we have to implement the system using off-the-shelf uh, components. Uh, you could design the system with uh, much simpler laser diodes, uh, I mean the uh, laser we used uh, had uh, below 10 kilohertz line width, uh, while we showed earlier that you could tolerate uh, larger line widths. So, uh, the need for such a precise control may be uh, rather exaggerated in this uh, figure. Okay, so um, this was the setup. Uh, when we measured, we saw that uh, the uh, more or less all the loss comes from the optical channel, that is, you don't have uh, losses in uh, between the your fibers connecting, let's say, the laser to the polarization controller and the phase modulator and stuff like that. All losses come uh, from here and uh, we did not use any optimized, uh, any specially optimized uh, fiber ports or collimators and for distance of 2, mil, uh, two, mi uh, two meters the uh, excess um, uh, the excess loss was about 12 dB so uh, even with off-the-shelf uh, components you still end up with significant power at the other end and um, here are some experiments we carried out now you see uh, both I and Q channels received at the, uh, at the coherent receiver. This is a polarization uh, divergent, uh, di with a, a receiver with polarization diversity, um, and it also has phase diversity, uh, of and this is of course required because you need to separate the I and Q um, channels which are spaced by 90 uh, degrees of um, which come with uh, 90 degrees of phase difference. Now, uh, there are times that the uh, laser phase noise um, acts in such a way that uh, on the you only get the I channel or sometimes when you only get the Q channel and this is due to the fact that laser noise varies with time. And uh, we also had the uh, interest to see whether we could dif uh, actually gather uh, the diffuse light, remember that I discussed that um, it is uh, virtually, we expect that it is impossible to uh, focus diffuse light uh, in, inside the fiber and even if we, do, if we did so it would not mix well with the local oscillator. Well, this is true, actually it turned out that it was impossible to mix, the, to uh, focus the diffuse components uh, the components coming from diffuse reflection. We did several experiments on this. 
we use uh, various focusing lengths, either uh, very simple lens or a cage system uh, with multiple lenses, and it was always impossible to get um, much uh, diffuse power inside the single mode fiber of the, which is the input of the coherent receiver. So uh, we measured um, uh, signal attenuations uh, for these diffuse components. Uh, well above the mu 30 dB, minus 30 dB, so uh, we actually see that uh, diffuse components, unlike uh, in IMDD case, the, uh, the um, coupling loss for the diffuse components is quite large, so we expect that uh, this is not uh, a real issue for coherent uh, technology. So. Uh, we now come to the conclusions uh, of this uh, three-part uh, presentation. Uh, okay, we saw that uh, indoor coherent optical wireless can operate with very low power, uh, below 10 milliwatts, uh, and this and th therefore can be classified as class I, class A, uh, I safe at the mid infrared. Uh, wavelength, uh, which means that if you place these transceivers in your network, you could actually uh, look at them directly without any uh, eye protection. So uh, you get an increased indoor coverage, about one, mil uh, one meter of radius for this uh, transmission powers. You get um, a high spectral efficiency, which means that you can transmit many bits per symbol. Uh, you could try high order QPSK, uh, high, sorry, higher order PSK and squeeze more bits in uh, a smaller bandwidth. This is important when you want to reduce the cost of electronics. Um, you can use advanced IQ modulation schemes like QAM or uh, PSK is not the only option here. Uh, Amplitude modulation is not the only option here because uh, the phase of the signal is preserved. Uh, you don't need equalization. I talked about this a lot. Uh, diffuse components are not of any concern. You get small size receiving apertures and you can get away with relatively manageable uh, laser line with, uh, line with requirements. You don't want you can, although, although you can, uh, it, it is uh, very good to have a uh, very narrow line width, um, you can get away with uh, sources with uh, line width larger than 1 megahertz in most cases. Now, once again, uh, if you want to contact me uh, require uh, for any questions that you may have on our project, um, my name is Dr. Thomas Kamalakis, here is my email. Uh, this presentation uh, can be found at the COUCH website, at the project website, I will include the link in uh, the video description below. And uh, in the site you can also find uh, deliverables, uh, the project deliverables, publication and photos. Of course the deliverables are in Greek, um, but I would be happy to provide any information you might require. And uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and hope that you found this uh, three-part uh, th uh, three uh, presentation interesting. Thank you very much.